If you will, turn with me for a few moments in your Bible to Psalm 118. Psalm 118, consider verse 6. David says, The Lord is on my side. <laughs> I like that. The Lord is on my side, and I will not fear. What can man do to me? Let that sink in for just a minute. The Lord's on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Hmm. What's the worst that man can do to us? Send us on to be with the Lord. Amen. Amen. Let me ask you a question today. Where does fear come from? Where does fear come from? Well, I can tell you it doesn't come from God. Look with me at 2 Timothy 1 verse 7. It says, For he's not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and of a sound mind. Thank you, Lord. Now, what I want you to see is it says he's not given us the spirit of fear. Did you realize fear is a spirit? Yep. It is. It's not just a mood, it's not just a feeling, but it's actually a spirit. Right. You look it up in, in Hebrew, and it's the same word that's used for the Spirit of God. It's, same, it's the same word that you use for an evil spirit. The word means a spirit, an entity. So, fear doesn't come from God. Fear comes where there is a lack of faith, either from not having a personal relationship with God or from not trusting His promises. The Bible says whatever is not of faith is sin. Think about that. So fear is a spirit from the enemy that comes and the opening is a lack of faith on our part. God does not want you living with a spirit of fear. You realize as you read through the Word of God, you find out there's only one legitimate fear. Just one. Five times the Bible tells us that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That's the only fear that you and I should have. That's the only fear that mankind should have is fearing that we're not in right relationship with God. Because you see, if we're not in right relationship with Him, we have plenty to be afraid of. But if we are, if we're in close personal relationship with Him, we should not be living in fear, walking in fear, and letting fear dominate our lives. And we've got to get hold of the fact it's not just an emotion, it's not just a feeling, but it's a spirit that comes and looks for an opening, and looks for an opportunity to come into your life. And it comes when there's a lack of a relationship with Jesus and a lack of trust in His promises. It's been said that fear is faith for what you don't want to happen. Think about it. How many times have we said, I'm afraid I'm getting sick? I'm afraid I'm coming down with the flu. I'm afraid, you know, on and on. It's faith for what you don't want. You're expecting it to happen, right? That's, that's what faith is. Faith is believing something and expecting it to happen to the point that you're doing something about it. Well, we say, I'm afraid I'm coming down with this, so what do we do? We run out and we get some alcohol surplus because we're acting in faith for what we don't want. Here's faith for what you don't want to happen. But it comes from a spirit. It's not just an emotion. And it comes from a lack of faith. And it comes from a, not having a close, that can come from not having a close personal relationship with Jesus. So the only fear that God wants us to have is a fear of, a holy fear, a holy reverence of Him, and a fear of not being in the right relationship. <clears throat> in fact, the writer of Ecclesiastes, chapter 12, verse 13, said, Let's hear the sum of the matter. In other words, let's get to the bottom line. The conclusion, the whole deal, fear God, keep His commandments. This is the whole duty of man. I'm one of those that like to cut to the chase. I like to see the bottom line. Now, my daughter, if I ask her a question, it will take her 30 minutes to answer. Because she will tell me every angle, every aspect, the background, the history, and on and on. I'm just saying, 
what's the bottom line? Just tell me the, and this is the bottom line of the Word of God. Fear God, keep His commandments. This is the whole beauty of man. So that's the only fear that God wants us to have. He does not want us to live in fear of other things because He has made a promise to us that He will supply our needs. I love something that Paul wrote over in Romans chapter 8 and verse 31. He said this. He said, if God be for us, who can be against us? Amen. Thank you, Lord. Man, that's good news, isn't it? Amen. David said, God is on my side. Amen. And Paul said, if God's for us, who can be against us? That's, I mean, I love that. But still, we have a tendency to fear. And I believe with all my heart, the reason that sometimes we let that spirit of fear creep in is because we lose sight of the majesty and the greatness of the God that we serve. Go with me for a moment over to Revelation chapter 1. John, who was privileged to write this book, was one of the closest disciples to Jesus. He was the one that was always beside him. He always made sure that he was the one that sat next to him at the table. He was the one that wanted to be beside him when they were going somewhere. He was called the beloved disciple. He was also called the disciple that Jesus loved. It didn't mean he didn't love the other people. It just meant somehow this fellow had just gotten close. And he was the one when they wanted something, as they'd say, John, you go ask him. <laughs> You remember that when you were a kid and you wanted to go to somebody's house and visit and if that child was with you, you'd say, you go ask my mom. Right. <laughs> she, she probably won't tell you no. Well, that's the way they were with John. John was the closest to him of anybody on this earth. So I'm not surprised that John's the one that was chosen to write the revelation. But consider this. As close as John was, when he saw Jesus as he is today, he fell at his feet as dead. Look at these verses. John, or John, Revelation chapter 1, John is talking about verse 10. He says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. What, what was he saying? He said, I'm the beginning and the end. I'm the circle that can't be broken. There's no beginning and there's no ending. I always was and I always will be. Amen. Now you and I cannot wrap our minds about that because everything that we know has a beginning and an ending. Life has a beginning and ending, at least the physical one that we see. Even a tree has a beginning and an ending. You see, you know, you got a little seed and then you see this giant tree and at some point that tree dies. God doesn't fit in that category because he's not as everything else. He is super. Human. He is supernatural. He exceeds everything we know or can possibly understand. He is above all. He is in all. He fills all. He always was. He always will be. We, you know, I'm, I'm thankful for one thing. As that old song says, we'll understand it all by and by. As long as we're walking in this human body, our brain cannot wrap itself around that concept. You can't, you know, how can something be that had no beginning? Well, that's because he's God. And there is none other like him. I am the Alpha, the beginning, Omega, the end, Greek alphabet. The first and the last. And he says, of course, what you see right now, send it to these seven churches. And I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks or lampstands, some versions said. In the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, Girt about the breast with a golden girdle. His head and hair were white like wool, white as snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet like undefined brass, as if they burned in a furnace. His voice as the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth was a sharp two-edged sword. His countenance was as the sun, shining in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. He laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. Behold, I'm alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Now that's the one who's on your side. That's the one who is for you. No wonder the Bible says who can be against. 
Why should we fear what man can do if this one is for us? Think about what that tells us. It tells us he's the beginning and the end. It tells us he holds the stars in his hand. It tells us that he shines brighter than the sun. Just ask Saul who became Paul when he saw him on the road to Damascus. He has the keys or the authority over death and hell. Mortal man cannot stand in his presence, and yet he lays his hand on us in love and mercy and tells us not to be afraid. That's the one who's on our side. I love the way he was seen by Isaiah. Go with me to Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah was one that received tremendous revelation from the Lord. And as God spoke to him, and Isaiah recorded these things, this just gives you a little bit more of a picture of what the God we serve is like. Verse 12 says, Who has measured the waters, let's talk about the oceans, the seas, in the hollow of his hand. Now that's a big hand. If he can hold all the waters of all the oceans, and you know what, I don't think that means just this planet. He can hold them all in his hand. In fact, he can measure them in the hollow of his hand. And then it says in the King James, he has meted out heaven with a span. You know what a span is? A span is the distance between your thumb and your finger when you stretch your hand out like that. And that word meted means measured. It means that he can hold his hand out like this and between his thumb and his little finger he can span the universe. If God be for us, who can be against us? It says, he has comprehended or measured the dust of the earth in a measure. And he's weighed the mountains and scales and the hills and balance. The earth is just like dust before. It's amazing to me. Think about that. Verse 17. Look at this. All the nations before him are as nothing. They are counted to him less than nothing and vanity. You know, we see all the nations on earth. We see their leaders. We see their armies. We see their posturing and they're threatening and all these things happening and God says <laughs> yeah right is that the best you got there's nothing before him verse 23 he bringeth the princes the leaders to nothing and he makes the judges of the earth as vanity they shall not be planted they shall not be sown. Their stock shall not take root in the earth. He will blow upon them. They will wither and the whirlwind will take them away. You know, we, we worry about the, the leaders in this world. We worry about the ones and nations that have made threats and boasts and they're going to do this and they're going to do that. And God says, you know what? I can blow on you and you'll vanish. The Lord is on my side. Amen. I shall not fear. What could man do unto me? You see, we serve the one whose hand bridges the universe. We serve the one who can hold the oceans in his hand. We serve the one that says these nations don't impress me at all. And if those princes are not doing what I want them to do when I'm fed up, I'll just breathe on them and they'll vanish. God's done it time after time. He brings the leaders to nothing. Verse 26, look at this. Lift up your eyes on high. Behold, who has created these things? Of course, he's talking about the stars. He brings out their hosts by number. He calls them, he calls them all by names, by the greatness of his might, for that he is strong in power, not one fails. He created the planets, the stars, the galaxies, calls them by name and maintains them by word. No wonder David said the heavens declare the glory of God. Amen. And the firmament shows his handiwork. Amen. Think about how great God is. Mm -hmm. So great a God and yet he has invited us to become his children. 
by returning to him, <coughs> repenting of our rebellion, and asking for his forgiveness and salvation. Look at Psalm 27. Psalm 27 and verse 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. But whom shall I be afraid? If we really believe the Word of God, if we really have a personal relationship with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, who should we fear? And of who should we be afraid? If He's for us and if He's on our side. Think about it. As long as Satan can keep us doubting the Word of God, as long as Satan can keep us from having that close, intimate relationship with Jesus Christ, as long as he can keep us distracted, focusing on the problems in our life, the problems that surround us in this world, as long as he can keep us worried about the economy or worried about this, that, or the other, then that spirit of fear has an opening that can come in and, and actually ruin our life and ruin our life. But if we get close to Jesus and if we're walking in, in that daily intimacy with Him and if we believe the Word of God, the spirit of fear can't stay. It has to leave. You remember what happened every time that Jesus came into the presence of someone that was possessed of some kind of spirit. That spirit cried out and said, don't send us into the deep. Don't, you know, don't torment us before the time. That spirit had to flee at the presence of God. And that spirit of fear will flee at the presence of Jesus Christ in your life if that relationship is living, if that relationship is growing, if we believe His Word. It's a spirit. It's not just a feeling or an emotion. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Who should I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom should I be afraid? Not only do we serve an incomparable, supreme being that holds everything in his hands, but he has an innumerable company of angels that do his will. And I love what the Bible says in Hebrews 1 verse 14. It says, are they not ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be the heirs of salvation. And you know, as I was reading that yesterday, I hadn't even thought about the fact it says, minister for them who shall be the heirs of salvation. I've talked to people that I knew for a long time, that we used to be wild together before, before Christ. And the, the comment was the same with most of us. I don't know how we survived. Now, I don't know. You may have grown up you know, as sweet as you could be. I probably fell off a crab apple tree. I don't know. I was real sweet. And a lot of people will testify to that. <clears throat> and I, you know, by all rights and intents and purposes, I should have been dead several times for all the stupidity that I did. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and it's the truth. But I'm still alive and I'm still here. And I got to thinking about that. And it says, God sent those angels to minister to those who would be the heirs of salvation. Now, we see people that don't make it through their wild state and they die in that wild state and then we see other people that live like the very devil did all kind of crazy stuff should have been dead and they survive and turn out to be born again children of God and I think here's what the key is I think God looks down through time and he sees the ones that will turn and he says you guys keep this idiot from what he's doing and keep him alive long enough because one day He's going to get on his knees before me. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for praying mom and dad. That's right. <laughs> Angels that minister for them who shall be the heirs of salvation. And if they're doing that with those that aren't saved, think about what they're doing for you today as a child of God. In fact, what does the Bible say? Psalm 34 and verse 7. 
it says the angel of the Lord camps round about those that fear him and delivers them. And I love the way that's written because in the Hebrew, that word encamps means to pitch a tent. In other words, God tells his angel or angels to pitch their tent around his people. You know, we're, Satan wants us to feel like we're alone in this world. But let me tell you, your child of God, you are not. Jesus said, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. He said, he said, if we will, you know, follow his orders, if we'll keep his commandments, he will come, the Father will come, they will come and make their abode with us, and the Holy Spirit's already with us, if you're a child of God. And we've got angels camped about us. The Lord's on our side. And if he's for us, who could be against us? Who should we fear? He's our life and our salvation, the strength of our life. Who should we be afraid of? God's not giving us a spirit of fear. We don't need that. We don't want it. Think about those angels that are camping around you right now if you're a child of God. Now, that, that may not think or seem like a whole lot to, but let me give you a little background. Most of us remember the story of when the Assyrians invaded. Hezekiah was the king. General name was Snockerib, and he decided he would come up and pulverize Jerusalem. But the king was a praying king. The prophets were praying. The priests were praying. And God said, Don't panic. I've got this. So God looked around and he said, Hey, you run to take care of this. And I don't know what angel he sent. Don't want them to go. But I know this. I'm not going to turn to it and read it, but you can jot it down. Second Kings, Second Kings 1935 says that that one angel, whichever one he sent, took out 185,000 troops in one night. One angel. So if the angel of the Lord is camping about you, I don't think there's much need to panic. Because he's got it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. We're still in Psalms for just a minute. Let's look at 37. Psalm 37, verse 3. David says, Trust in the Lord and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit thy way to the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. Amen. Now think about that. God says, if you will trust in me, do what I tell you to do, I'm going to feed you, I'm going to take care of you. You're going to live, and you're going to prosper. Then he says, if you'll delight in me, I'll give you the desires of your heart. And then he says, if you'll commit your way to me and trust me, I'm going to bring to pass what needs to happen. I'm going to bring to pass even those things that you really want in your life, unless there's something that will hurt you. I'll bring to pass. How do I know that? Because this is what the Word says. It says, no good thing will be withhold to those that love and that trust him. God's on your side. You don't need to fear. Now, why would God do all that? Why would God make those promises to you? Well, the answer to that is in Romans chapter 8, and verse 15. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. See there, you've not been given the spirit of fear. But you've received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. And that word Abba is as close as we can get to daddy. And he's a good daddy. Because, and I'm going to turn to this, but if you go to Matthew 7 and verse 11, it says, if you, being evil, know how to give good things to your children, 
How much more will your heavenly Father give good things to those that ask him? Why? Because he's a good father. And because he's placed within you that spirit of adoption that should eradicate that spirit of fear and you will walk in trust and in close relationship with your daddy. Now maybe you didn't have a great earthly daddy. Maybe he was flawed like most of us and maybe he wasn't there when you needed him and maybe he wasn't the loving father that you would like to have had. But let me tell you, the one that sits on the throne is the one that loved you so much that he paid the price for your sin. That he didn't leave you helpless and hopeless, but he put in motion a plan from the beginning before the foundation of the world so that when you came on the scene and you were a sinful person, and understand this, if you never sinned in your life, you're still sinful because we've inherited it. It's in our blood all the way down from Adam and Eve. Our bloodline is contaminated. But he loved us so much that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to give that sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness and he makes this promise to you, your sins and iniquities I will remember no more. Glory to God. That's the Father that we have now. Who should we fear? What should we be afraid of? Absolutely nothing. Because he's not given us a spirit of fear but the power and love of the sound mind. And if you want to kind of wrap this up with something. Let's look at Second Chronicles, Second uh, Corinthians <coughs> chapter 5. And I love what this says. Second Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 1. Paul says, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal, in the heavens. Amen. And as he writes that, he's talking about two things. He's talking about the place that Jesus went to prepare. You remember? John chapter 14. I love it when he's talking to his disciples and he says, listen, I'm going to prepare a place for you because in my Father's house are many mansions. <coughs> so I'm going to go and I'm going to take care of this. But something else he's talking about here is the house, you see, God considers these bodies a house, a tent, a tabernacle. That's what tabernacle means. It means tent. And you see, we live in these houses that we walk around with. But God says, you know, if this one falls apart, don't panic because I've got you enough prepared. In fact, the Bible says that this new house is going to be fashioned like Jesus' glorious body. You know, the one that uh, John saw there on the Isle of Patmos that was so awesome he couldn't stand in the presence of the glory that was coming out of him. The Bible says, now we're the sons of God. And it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. <laughs> Can you imagine? Can you imagine what it's going to be like? When we shine with the glory of God, when we're in that supernatural body that can do the things that, that Jesus could do. Think about it. When he rose from the dead, he was able to just pass through walls with no problem. One minute he was in a room, the next minute he was gone. And I believe we'll be that same way because the Bible says we're going to be fashioned like his glorious body. He was able to be in one place and then in another place. In a moment of time, I think we'll be the same way. Why? Because we, are, we were created in the image of God. And we're being recreated in the image of God. We're not God by any stretch of the imagination. But we are His children. And children have a similarity, a resemblance to their parents. What a future that's ahead for us. If God be for us, who can be against us? God is on our side. Think about that. God is not against you. He is for you. He's pulling for you every day. Satan wants you to think he's sitting up there with a notepad saying, yep, I saw him do that, saw him do that, saw him do that. And I'm, oh, this is what we're going to do. Now what he wants is when you and I mess up, and we do, and we will, as long as we're in this world. 
He wants us to come and say, Daddy, I blew it. Forgive me. And what does it say? If we confess our sin, He's faithful and just to forgive it and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If God be for us, who could be against us? That's who we serve. The Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last, the one that was alive and was dead and now is alive forevermore and has the keys of death and the grave, death and hell. The one who sits on the throne of heaven, the one who measures the universe with an outstretched hand, the one that can hold the waters of all the oceans in the palm of his hand, heaven and earth cannot contain him. <clears throat> the one who says, I will never leave you. Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. The Lord is on my side. So today, are you troubled by fear? Are you worried about the future? If so, do you have a personal relationship with Jesus? Have you asked him to be your Savior and repent of your sin? Do you spend time in his word? Because if you will, that fear is going to go away. Because God's for you. The Bible says you'll know the truth. And the truth will make you free. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And if you know him, you'll be freed from that spirit of fear. Amen. Let's bow our heads. Father, I thank you for revealing to us the glory of the God that we serve. Lord, I thank you for revealing to us your great love and your mercy. Lord, I thank you for showing us that fear is not something that you want us to have. It's not something you ever intended for us to have, but it's the spirit that the enemy brings looking for an opening to insert it in our life. And that opening comes when we don't have that relationship with Jesus and when we don't believe the Word of God. But Lord, I thank you that when the truth comes on soon, that spirit has to flee. I pray for every person seated here today, Father, that if there's anyone here first and foremost, if there's anyone here that does not have that personal relationship with Jesus, if there's anyone here that does not know beyond a shadow of a doubt that they have asked the Lord Jesus Christ to be their Savior, that they've asked for forgiveness of their sin, that they've given their life to Him, let this be the moment. Now is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. That's what your word says. We don't put that off. We have no promise of tomorrow. So Father, I pray that Holy Spirit would move right now. If there's anyone here that doesn't know that for sure, let this be the moment. And as we're praying, as our heads are bowed, I just want to give you this opportunity. If you're not certain of your salvation, if you want to make sure that any doubt will be erased as we're here in this moment, as our heads are bowed, as our eyes are closed, if you're not sure and you want to be sure, just lift your hand to the Lord and say, Lord, I'm here. I want to know that I'm saved. I want to know that my sins are forgiven, that my name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Just lift up your hand and say, Jesus, here I am. I want to know. I want to be saved. I want to be forgiven. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Lord, I ask you to touch each one of these. God, I pray that that confirmation would be in them. And I thank you that you said, call and I will answer. Come and I will not turn you away. So when we come to you and we surrender our lives and ask your forgiveness, Lord, you receive us with open arms. You will not turn us away. So Lord, I ask you to bless each one of these. And, and Lord, just draw them close and let them have that close relationship with you. Lord, for others that may have let fear creep in because of unbelief, because of being distracted by the cares of this life, I pray that this would be the moment, Lord, of, of renewal, a moment when that truth just makes them free and they're filled with the spirit of the living God and fear is banished from their life. God, I pray that your people would walk in victory. I pray that we would walk every day with the knowledge that you're on our side, you're for us, you're not against us. We we have nobody to fear because we walk with the King of all kings and the Lord of all lords, surrounded by his angels in count about us. God, let us be reminded of that every day. And Lord, let us walk in victory. 
Let us walk in joy and let us walk with a readiness to tell the world why we have hope and why we can be as we are in a difficult time. God, we ask your blessing on each of these today. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. And everybody say it. Amen. Amen. All right. God bless you. If somebody needs prayer or anything, I'll be here for a little bit. Hope you have a wonderful Lord's Day.